demonstrate with some pieces from Saturday night's concert, uh, which includes the Uber Gurm or the, the suite, orchestral suite, uh, BWB 1067 for flute and strings. Uh, we have Andre Andrea LeBlanc on flute, and uh, Sarah in, and I will be playing the bass line, and I'll be filling in the harmonies. Um, and the, the flute suite has movements that are, uh, except for the very first movement, every other movement has a dance title. And so those are definitely dance influenced. Uh, we're going to begin with the minuet, and I'm going to let Caroline, our wonderful choreographer and principal dancer, take over at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, the minuet was one of the most popular dance forms of the 18th century. Um, every dancing manual that was printed in Spain, in Italy, in France, in Germany, uh, in England, they all talk about the minuet, and the minuet is considered the dance that all young gentlemen and ladies had to learn. So, um, it, because within the dance you have all of the, uh, we'll call them uh, niceties, is not the right word, but there, there's a certain um, kind of generosity of spirit that's shown within the dance. First of all, we have the offering of hands, we have the giving of um, honors, so we, we honor the audience, we honor each other, and then we proceed throughout a, a kind of a set spatial pattern. Uh, that incorporates different figures, which we can talk about. And in, within the dance, the gentleman offers the right hand, he then offers the left hand, and then there's both hands, and of course we always end with the honors. So what's nice about the minuet, what I love about it, is that there's a set pattern in space that they did in the ballroom, but the rhythmic steps uh, could change and it was also improvisatory, so it's not um, a set choreography like you might have in the theater. And they also performed minuets on stage, and those would have included more complicated step patterns and bigger leg gestures and such. Uh, what's interesting about the minuet step is each dancing master had their own take on it, on what the rhythm could be. So um, Julian and I have a lot of different rhythms going on. If we were in Germany, in Leip Leipzig, um, one dancing master, Talbert, wrote in 1717 that his preferred rhythmic um, step is, uh, let's see if I can do it, one, three, four, six, one, three, four, six, one, three, four, six. Now you might notice I'm counting the minuet six, and the dancing masters also tell us that we have to count the minuet six, not the three because one step unit covers two bars of music. But if you're um, studying with Kellen Tomlinson in England, he would say, oh, we like this step in England. One, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if you're in France, they say, oh, what are the English and the Germans now? I mean, really, if you're going to study the menu, you might have to study it in France. And uh, they had a lot of rhythmic Steps one was one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you're going to the left, you can't do that same rhythm. You have to do one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, six. So we think that the early minuet was a lot on the balls of the feet, the balls of the toes. And um, as the minuet goes on in the 18th century, it became more of a walking, gliding, um, slower, more stately dance. So by the time George Washington, who led out many a minuet in his time and was known to dance indiscriminately and all night long, uh, he would take the, the English timing, but on the flat foot. <laughs> the other reason why I love the minuet is um, you can do a minuet of one movement, two movements, three movements, or none at all, which means that it's most basic. You're just doing a rhythmic walk to the music. A mouvement in Baroque dance, that's kind of that's like the crux of the technique. A mouvement is a bend and a rise, which is easy enough. The tricky thing is how you bend and rise in time to the music. And they felt that how one bent their knees and rose in time to the music was the mark of a good dancer. Um, so that's called a mouvement. Musicians talk about mouvement in different ways. 
right? There's also the mouvement of the soul. Our jobs as performers is to uh, move, to move you all, and to maybe even be moved ourselves, right? We want to find a moment of peace of mind. In mouvement in music, is there like a mouvement of the bow or uh, anything? You all be using that word in, in some way, shape, or form.
had so much fun this morning. We came in at 10, 10 o'clock and we experimented with what, uh, which of the movements from this dance suite, and we call it sometimes a dance suite, because there's an ouverture and then there's a rondo, which we're going to talk about now, a uh, bourree, a sarabande, a minuet, a, um, and those are all dances. And in Bach's time, certainly we know he didn't write these to be danced to. He wasn't really writing them for the theater, but writing them more for the concert hall or the parlor. Probably a room just like about this size. I mean, I think the acoustics in here are great for this ensemble. Um, so we, were looked at, we looked at some of the other movements, and we wanted to talk about which of the movements are very stylized. So I was thinking of a, a, a dance that everybody would know today, the waltz. So you, you would recognize a waltz if you heard the old one, you would hear that. But you wouldn't dance to Ravel's La Vaz, which is a waltz. So that's a very stylized version of a waltz. Um, the Bach movements are often very stylized. They might be called a bourre or a gavotte, but it's, uh, in, it has the sort of back the pedigree of the, the, the rhythmic influences, the rhythmic patterns, but it might not have exactly been danced to. So the rondo, which is the second movement of the suite, is actually sort of a gavotte, and we wanted to talk about that. So we're going to play a little bit of it at the concert tempo. This is something we all as performers have to think about when we're performing dance music, um, or music that's influenced by dance. Do we perform it at a tempo that would be, okay, well, you could you dance a gavotte to this tempo, or do you find a tempo that works for the music? And sometimes it, they're the same, sometimes they're very different. Here's our concert tempo of for the rondo. <laughs> Which was a court dance that the court police wore. 
Speaking of Louis the Fourteenth, I can't go, let uh, you said since Fourteenth just reminds me that today is Bastille Day. Um, we'd love to talk about the Sarabande, and this is, uh, I want to have Caroline talk about the dance, and then I want to give just a very brief uh, description of what Bach does with this Sarabande, so if you could talk about it. Well, I think what we were talking about earlier is, um, I find as a dancer listening to Bach's Sarabande, I get really lost in the sauce, and I never can find the downbeat. So we were talking about that when uh, they were playing the Sarabande, that it's, you, you, <laughs> once you find the pulse, Whatever it is, you have to you have to really keep it in your body strictly because there's something about the way that Bach's moving the measures around that it's very easy to lose the downbeat. And uh, and Julie and I were talking about how um, like for us in dance, what articulation could mean is attacking the downbeat very clearly or choosing a certain beat in the measure to highlight. It could be the second beat in the measure or the third or find a moment of repose at the end of the measure. So those are just some things that we were talking about. The Saraban could be as simple or complex as you want it, as a, like a for a dance piece. Um, and I think that's kind of what we were talking about. Yeah. I want to do a little musical demonstration. But I also want to just ask my colleagues, did we just do the A section? I don't think we played the B. Did we? We did just the A section twice? Okay. So um, interestingly, um, Andrew, play the, just the melody. So Bach is so many things. He's a great creator of beautiful melodies and a great contrapuntalist. Uh, he can take a melody like that and have it simultaneously played uh, a fifth lower, almost. If he did that, here's what it would sound like. by offsetting it by one bar. Now Sarah and, and Andrea play, uh, and I'm not even gonna play. So listen to, uh, they're playing exactly the same melody, but Sarah's playing it a fifth lower and starting a bar later. as an architect, um, because I don't understand very much about architecture, but I love beautiful buildings. So I may not know what an architrave is or a, a balustrade, or I don't, may not know what each portion is, but I love the, 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 the building itself. Anybody can appreciate the beauty of this music. It's also interesting to know the subtleties of that it's actually a canon at the fifth. Um, and if you don't know that it's a canon at the fifth, it's still glorious music, and it does dance beautifully to each of its members. Yes. So we'll do the A section.
was saying to ourselves out of earshot how uh, Caroline and, and who is, what a delight it is for us to be able to see this because we often as uh, instrumentalists, when we're playing dance music, we imagine the dance. To actually see it come alive in front of our faces is just so, it, it's going to make this concert on Saturday night so rich because we're all going to have this in our, in our minds. Um, let's talk about the bourree. Um, so this uh, bourree, is, this is a case where the concert tempo we think actually works rather well. Do you want to talk about the dance of the bourree? Um, well, there's a lot of jumping, springing, and quick shifts of weight. And in this case, you have the, the bourree. There's lots of different pot of bourrees. And a lot of jetés and ensemble and tissons. So it's a light, springing, gay kind of dance. Can you oh. talk about the length of oh, the yeah. 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 And uh, because of that, usually notated berets are only, you know, the most notated dances are like A, A, B, B. Not all of them, but many of them are. So something like a jig, which we'll find later, and the beret, um, you know, it's these are not really long affairs. They're like a beret can maybe be like 35 seconds long, 45 seconds long, minute max. But of course, Bach must have had a good sense of humor because he just keeps going and going and going and going. And going. Because everybody knew what was required in a bourree. That's part of the humor and the exhaustion. So um, spontaneously, uh, Julian and I decided we're going to do a little tag tag team bourree because for one person to dance the whole thing is really exhausting. <laughs> Then there's another phrase, two phrases in that very same uh, kind of uh, rhythm, same kind of melodic uh, element, and that's the Polonaise itself. Then Bach writes double for the next piece, and a double is it's, uh, it's spelled like our word double, and it's exactly what you might think. It goes twice as fast in the flute part, but in the cello part, Sarah now has the melody that Andrea played. So play, play. And above that, the filigree and the intricacy that Bach writes in the flute part is this. So listen, focus on 
I'll tell you, I, I, I heard I played this piece for 20 years before I even knew that the bass had the melody. <laughs> it's so interesting and so elegant and intricate. Uh, but so try to open both sides of your brain and listen to both of the bass. <laughs> today and really listen to the bass line. We tend to, and uh, we're, we're so treble focused in our listening sometimes that um, one of the, the, my very first organ lesson when I took, uh, when I went to Oberlin College and my teacher David Bow, may he rest in peace, um, one of the very first things he said was, oh, you need to be with the bass line. In Baroque music, the bass line is the foundation for everything. And so, um, and that was the beginning of my awakening of understanding Baroque music, and it always comes from the bass line, and Sarah uh, does it. <laughs> so, so, Caroline, would you talk about the Polonaise oh, sure. and what, what this might be? Well, as, uh, as dancers going up in dance studios, if you're lucky, you'll have a, a character class where you learn uh, mazurkas and waltzes and polonaises. And so Julian and I were talking about in the in pedophiles ballet in the late 19th century, lots of polonaise and mazurkas. And usually we think of a brisker tempo, but a polonaise was like, it's like the Pavan in the Renaissance. It had a ceremonial quality to it, um, usually a processional. It opened the ball, for instance. And we were thinking a, a good tempo for that would be a one, two, one, three, and one. It has a very like martial feel. This has a stately feel and is a little slower. And while we were playing it, so first we started with just our basic polonaise step, which we can do. So we had one, two, three, da, da, da. So we're doing our basic polonaise step. We'll do this one round of that. And then I thought, if I just started using French world steps, what would I do naturally? And I found myself doing steps that one would find in the Quran, which is another slow triple meter dance. And so, and it's a comp, that you use a compound step pattern, meaning I have like two distinct steps each measure. For instance, a coupe and then a jeté, or a ton de courant and a demi-coupe or a jeté. So I found myself wanting to do a kind of courant stepping to the polonaise. So we're going to show you the polonaise basic, and then he's going to continue with the polonaise basic, and then I'm going to continue uh, doing some courant steps. Excellent. So let's do A, A, B, B. And then for the people, why don't we just do it?
jig or the jig. Now, there's no jig in the flute suite, but in the French suite, which I pl uh, played last night at the concert, uh, there is a jig that ends the piece. And I mentioned this in my talk last night before I played it, that Caroline had said, oh, this is, it, it's, a jig is normally, well, it, normally the phrases are much shorter. Uh, Bach writes this jig and it goes on and on and it extends and it extends and it extends. And it's, it would be exhausting to dance. So, but say it in your words. Well, that, that, that basically sums it up. So just so you all know, there was a system of dance notation uh, that, I mean, there were several that were being uh, created around the 1680s and 90s in France. And the one that really stuck as a um, memorization tool for people all over Europe was this system of notation that was originally created by Pierre Beauchamp, who was one of the dancing masters of Louis XIV, of course, European, you have to have more than one. And, um, but uh, Monsieur Fillet received the privilege from the king to first print it, but he didn't give Beauchamp credit. So sometimes you'll hear this notation called Fillet notation, but he, he didn't get credit for it. In fact, he was sued later on. <laughs> not giving credit for it. So that's a whole other story. So, but what we have here is the jig, uh, de, it's, a, it's a jig for two dancers. There's always the music at the top of the page. They tell you where you're going. And this dance is only four figures long. So each page is considered a figure. And there's only four figures in this dance. Um, it's a nine measure phrase, a nine measure phrase, and then a 12 and a 12. And that's it, because this was part of an opera. And a lot of the dances, it went from a sung form to a dance, to the chorus, to the singing, to the dancing, and chorus, as we'll see tomorrow. That's called a divertissement. So the dance excerpts are pretty short. Hence, Jig playing a big uh, joke on <laughs> dancers like me who listen to his music and say, but I want to dance to this Jig. It's so great. And so I started, I actually have performed to this whole Jig. I'm only going to do the A. And it's really exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if I, uh, here, I'll start over here, maybe. Okay. 
So, but it, it has a very characteristic rhythm. This um, so it has this real swing to it that people would have recognized as a Siciliano or a, a kind of a pastoral movement. Um, <clears throat> A very comforting and very supportive rhythm that goes along with the words that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's also a little bit melancholy. Uh, it's in D minor. It's rather slow. It has that very slow movement. The choral parts above this are just exquisite, so I hope you'll come on Saturday to hear that. Following that movement, there's a brilliant aria, which I'm going to ask Jennifer Bates to sing. She, she has a, we just rehearsed it yesterday, so I think, do I love Jennifer? And Jennifer, by the way, was a big star, one of many stars last night, um, because she... A, a, a Monte Claire cantata. Uh, our scheduled singer, Nola Richardson, is one of the people who got COVID and couldn't come. Um, and so Jennifer, in two days, learned a beautifully French cantata, which she sang brilliantly last night about the death of Dido. Um, and in this cantata, in uh, Cantata 68, the aria that she's going to sing for us now is an interesting aria in several ways. It asks, it calls for an instrument that um, is very unusual, called the violoncello piccolo, or meaning the small cello. And maybe, Sarah, you could talk about what that would be. I mean, you're... Well, well um, there have been various comments as to what it really was. Um, but we believe that it was a five-string cello with an E-string atop, like the, an E-string the way a violin has. So it would have, um, uh, which means that pieces that Bach wrote he wrote his sixth cello suite for violoncello piccolo, and there are a number of cantata movements this way as well, including this one. That the music goes much higher than Bach normally does for the cello because the cello is usually just the bass line, um, and in this case, it, it takes on a more starring role. Some people will tell you that actually it's an instrument held this way, with the same tuning and the same pitch, so like a really, really large viola. Um, uh, called the viola de braccia, meaning that it's held by the arm, and it's it's got a sort of ribbon to help hold it up, and it looks incredibly ungainly, but it can sound gorgeous. But of course, <laughs> I'm biased. I know that there are 17th and 18th century five-string cellos, piccolo <coughs> cellos. They still exist, um, and I have to admit that I have one at home. Yeah. But it's it's not a piccolo cello. It's I I got a um, a dual cello, so it's a hybrid, and I, I use it as a big cello, a basso violon. And um, it has two bridges and two sets of holes so that I can switch between four strings of five. Mm -hmm. And this little nut comes out and switches. But it's big because I use it as a big cello when I need it. And which means it hurts my hand when I have to play up high. So um, it makes me work out a lot harder on this one. <laughs> so there's a, uh, uh, as I said, this is a movement, well, maybe I didn't say it. This is a movement that has dance inspiration. It could be, you could find gavotte rhythms in this. You could find bourree rhythms. You saw bits of gavottes and bourrees already today. And in this case, the text is so joyous. It's my heart, uh, my gläubiges Herz, Frohlock at Zin Scherzen. Uh, my faithful heart, rejoice and be glad because Jesus is here. And so it's a, a text that's just infused with joy. And you hear it first in the cello. We're going to play the bit from Hello. <laughs> Thank you. 
tricks up his sleeve. Doesn't end it there, but he asks an oboist and a violinist to then pick up their instruments and play a beautiful trio sonata to end this cantata with the same, the same character. So you'll hear all of that on Saturday. I have to make one comment. Yeah. As I've been practicing this, and you know, it always ends with a scale. And I was practicing away, and I got to a certain point where I got to, it changes key. And that is the beginning of the first cello piece. Thank you, Jennifer. So, I wanted to, uh, we want to actually end with the minuet because I've never seen anything quite so beautiful and I've never heard anything quite so beautiful as what we just did. Um, I know that uh, my colleagues all, I'm not involved in the concert tomorrow, but I am going to be smiling in the audience and enjoying every minute of it, but they all have to go immediately over to the Atlantic Folk Company to rehearse. So I'm willing to be happy to stay around if anybody has any questions. Um, Caroline, did you want to take any questions now? Or, uh, sure. Somebody next? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I wanted to know about male-female relationships in opera. Do you know that male is in charge and women belong? That's what they keep telling us. Well, <laughs> uh, so, okay. We're gender roles in dancing, so on the stage, a male solo, because you could actually see their legs, they would have the more filigree steps, more jumping, more beatings, more tortillas, more run de jambes, more pirouettes. Mm -hmm. And the women's steps, they were sprightly, there was jumping, uh, quick movements, complicated rhythms, but because you couldn't see as much of, of their legs, um, they didn't have all the beating, but there were ballerinas who did entrecha. There are choreographies where women are turning and doing pirouettes. And then gradually, as the 18th century goes on, the women are like, is this okay? Is this okay? And they just keep lifting the skirt. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the romantic period, you could like, see more of what, you know, what we're dancing to. And, um, and in the ballroom, it's kind of the same way. The women are, there's lots of rules for women. Uh, it's not stately to jump in the ballroom. You should stay terre a terre, have a soft bounce, always hold your skirt, um, have a mirror, a modest look on your face, never hold anybody's gaze for too long so that people start talking. Um, the dancing is you know, there's like copious uh, writing about how to behave in the ballroom. But in terms of the dance repertoire, the men's steps tend to be more filigree than the women's steps. And in the ballroom, men had access to all the corps de bras, meaning low, medium, and high, but women only had low. <laughs> that, but of course, if they're telling us this over and over again, it must mean that not everyone was following the rules. <laughs> we don't need to restate rules that everybody's already following. So I'm assuming if you're a young woman, you're, you're going to be carried away by the spirit, and you're or going to jump, and you're going to maybe use your port bra if you're capable of doing so. Yeah. Yes? I have a question about the arm placement, mm -hmm. because I noticed, like, you hold them, you both, and then one hold them like this, and when did it eventually raise? Well, so, and, so they had movements of the wrist in the Baroque period, if you want to warm your wrist up. Oh. <laughs> they had movements of the forearms, everything was circular. See, we're, all, we're working on a system of circles here. And in the, uh, for stage dancing, they had higher movements of the arm. So they had movements of the shoulder girdles. Movements of the wrist correspond with movements of the instep. Uh, forearms and knees correspond. And then the larger leg gestures for the shoulder girdle. And then they had oppositional arms. Right? So, um, and they also had the Ombreggiare, right? The apomal, the shading of the shoulders. So, um, and the, again, the arms were individual. They didn't really notate the arms very much. That was something that you and your dancing master would work on because they really felt that arms were particular to everybody's unique genius, meaning your unique gifts as a human being and your stature and such. Yeah. Yes? How many couples would have been dancing at a given time? It depends on how formal, if it was a very formal occasion, they would have had, the dan a dancing master would have been in charge of the event, and he would have had a list with how many like, people, you know. And so there could be like endless amounts of minuets and bourrées and different kinds of choreographed dances, and then everybody could get up. And those were usually dance à deux, those dance dances for two people. Usually balls open with dances for two people. 
And then, I mean, then everybody could get up and do what everybody wanted to do, which is dance together and like contra dancing or country dancing. Or you had a line of men set up against a line of women, for instance, and then quadrilles or, or like square dancing became popular. Um, so, but it kind of depended on, but like at a masquerade ball, I'm sure like country dancing and contra dancing would be more fun. And they also published hundreds of those. So you could look at the music, you could look at the figures in space to prepare yourself before the season falls. So you said there's a, a fair amount of preparation before the dance, but then there's also a certain amount of improvisation during the dance. And over the decades, did it start out as being just for the genteel or also for ordinary folks? I, well, so this is a big question. I think a lot of the dance, I think there was a, there was cross breezes blowing. So I think um, the minuets and bourrees, I think those were dances that were done in the countryside too. It's just that when they came to court, they became codified and I'll call it more boring or stilted or formal, right? And whereas if, if you were doing a minuet in the countryside, there might have been, it might have felt more lively or improvised or different instrumentation, right? So, um, and if you wanted to present yourself at court, then you had to prepare, because if you did not put your best foot forward, like what happened at Versailles, some, there's a famous story where a gentleman came and he flubbed a dance in front of everybody, and, uh, but claimed to be a very good dancer, and then he like went away for a little bit, came back, did the same thing, and then they're like, that's it, you're out, you're out of Versailles. <laughs> so, kind of like the cast of Mean Girls over there, they were done. But, um, so you really did prepare with your dancing. But I think country dancing was more forgiving, right? Because that's groups of people. And as long as one person knows what they're doing in the couple, then you're good to go if anyone's been country dancing. Yeah, and this idea of like who's leading men or women, and that they say that in a minuet, the man would lead and signal with the hat. But years of dancing has taught me that whoever the best dancer is amongst you is the person who is leading, or the one who knows the most, right? Yeah. Okay, somebody else has there. Yes. Oh um, yes. Um, so there were always the dancing masters. I'm sure always considered themselves professional dancers. They were mainly men. And the first record we have of a female professional professional dancer on the stage was at the Paris Opera in 1681 in uh, Le Triomphe de l'Amour, Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, who retired to a convent. Not just one, but two. After she gave up the stage dancing, we were talking about convents. And so I wonder if she kept dancing when she retired from her convents. Yes? The jig is, in fact, the cue. How do you deal with the various voices that come in? Do you just follow the first one? Do you change uh, the Well, I mean, I would say that if you're trying to choreograph in the Baroque style, Baroque dance usually illuminates the notes on the page. Like, we are the notes made visible. So you would really want to know if it's a fugue, and you would want to try to match the voices or bring in the, uh, bring in a new concept when a new melodic concept is introduced. So they were pretty strict with how they, but this music, again, wasn't, they didn't dance with us. But you can, you can tap your toes to it now, right? Yeah, yeah they're definitely doing that. Yes? Were non-professionals expected to be at the proposal of subsidy as what you've shown us, or was it made a little simpler? Uh, I think that people, you know, uh, well, if, so if you're doing just country dancing, you only need to have like a few steps in your vocabulary. One is this step, the skipping step, that's a demi contretemps Another one is a pas de bray. So that's a good, and then the other one is doing slips. So you probably only needed like three or four steps in your repertoire to like make a passable uh, uh, performance in like a country dance. But if you wanted to do uh, like the Giga de, even though it's from Roland, I'm not sure it was performed in the opera Roland. It was just that those tunes were so popular, dancing masters would then say, oh, everybody's singing that Gigue de Roland. I gotta create a dance to it, then I'm gonna sell it on the street. And people were like, oh, let's learn this. So the steps that I did for that, a hop and a leap and a hop and a leap and a pas de bourre, which is pay, which is pay, amateur dancers were doing that. Yes. Yes, and of course we have paniers and corsets and all the other stuff. Yes, yes, sir. In the repetition of the A section or the B section, does the dancer uh, ornament something or does something different the second time? Usually, from what we see, well, actually, actually, the Gigue de Roland 
the AAA, and this is just one example out of 350 examples that we have of dance notations. Um, the couple does the A, and then they repeat the A exactly, but they change where they go in space. So there is a variation spatially. Um, sometimes when they repeat an A, they don't repeat the same steps. They do a different pattern in space. So they can kind of treat repeats differently. But me, if I'm doing, for instance, um, a dance where it's eight measures on the right side and eight measures on the left, which we see a lot in uh, dancing for the ballroom, I would, I, personally, I would choose never to do the same thing the same way twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we should do another act. In fact, oh, we sure. have time for one more question. Alice, were you going to ask one? No, no, I was trying to. Oh, you're about to. So, and before we dance, before they dance to the new one, I did also want to thank our hosts at Barn Castle. This is Yay. such a, such a great <laughs>